better. All right. Okay. So without any further ado, here's Jim to introduce uh, Ann Staley and the readers. Okay. Oh, I'm introducing Ann. <laughs> well, Ann and I, Ann is like an older sister. She's one of my best friends in Oregon. And uh, I'll talk about mo more about that. I chose poems I could relate to as her friend if I get to read. But we have an order which starts with Marilyn Johnston. So you're on. All right. Uh, first of all, thank you for the honor of being part of this uh, reading and in honor of this wonderful woman and poet who touched so many of us on this uh, Zoom. I, I first met Anne years ago when we were both attending a writing event. And then I took several of her workshops that she had facilitated and then for years, we've been writing together on a weekly Tuesday afternoon poetry writing a group, which several members here are a part of. Uh, she was a wonderful friend and an encouraging poet to so many of us. And we know now how through poetry, we often share the most private and intimate parts of ourselves. And we're lucky that Anne left behind these poems to remind us she's still here amongst us. I'd like to read two short poems. Uh, one is my favorite poem of hers. Uh, I think, um, well, one of my favorite, I should say, uh, followed by a response to the poem, which we often would do in our weekly writing group as we riff off a poem that was offered. So um, this is the first um, offering and it's Anne's poem from uh, The Afternoon Sky, Harney Desert, that was printed in 2017. It's called Elegy. This is where the poem holds its breath, where the usable truth sways sorrowing and the people sway with the truth of it. And this is where the poem enters the twilight. This is where the book closes and the Howard clock opens and the clock closes and the book opens to songs so little brown birds murmur and a red fox dodges in and out of the grasses. This is where the geese fly unabashedly out and the sky turns white and wild with sound. This is where tumult, this is where prophecy this is where the poem repents of language. This is where the poem enters the silence where the child holds a book in her lap, whose pages are aflamed with life, whose song sways with a usable truth sorrowing. This is where it swells like the gray green Pacific where the pear blossoms fall like confetti and the continent splits open for one poem the way a life lived calls on us to praise it. Mm. Elegy. And in response, I took one of the couplets and I called it After It All for Anne. This is where the geese fly unabashed out and the sky turns white and wild with sound. And the same winds that blow us near then apart, both missing and touching like ships at sea, us drifting as we wave from deck. Sometimes we come aboard if we dare risk to break down the walls we built around the very thing that held us. New, old, we'll part like that, dear friend. They say nothing lasts forever, but what they mean is never long enough if you love it. Mm. Thank you. Lovely, lovely, thank you. Mm. Well, if that's it, our next reader, also from the Tuesday Writing Group, is Bar Scott. And uh, looking forward to it. Okay. Um, I'm a new friend of Anne's. Uh, we moved to Corvallis about three years ago and we're, we're neighbors. Uh, so friends, I met Courtney, Courtney was my first Corvallis friend, and then I met Anne, and she invited me into the Tuesday group. So I was inclined to read something um, in, in her new collection, which is Small Beauties. And I want to read moments, and then I'm going to do uh, what Marilyn did and, and uh, give you my response. 
moments. Moments are our teachers. They might feel too short or too long, lasting a lifetime of grief, a sunset of joy. My sweet black and white tuxedo cat is dying from inoperable cancer. My Peace Corps friend of 50 years is now in late stage Parkinson's. My book of poems dedicated to him is at the publishers and I very much want him to have a copy of it before he leaves this earth. I wish I had faith in the hereafter, but I do not. And God, impossible. What saves us is our love for each other and the moments we recall at the end of any ordinary day. What went well? Maybe this poem. So the other day I was walking by Courtney and Nan's house and just um, thinking about her. And I said this sort of more or less out loud to myself. It's called Absence. Oh, Anne, where are you now? Gone, I know, but where? I can't believe you're nowhere, but I don't believe you're somewhere. If you were here, we'd talk about it. Agree that what we're left with is memory and love, that these two things are almost everything. So um, I'm gonna read this because uh, Courtney and Ann gave me this book not too long ago, The Book of Awakening um, by Mark Nepo. And I just opened it up this afternoon on June 1st. Yesterday was Ann's birthday. And I read this this afternoon. I thought it was worth sharing with you. Walking north, walk long enough and we all trade places, June 1st. We are always surrounded and carried by the whole while we take turns holding and being held, falling and getting up, listening and trying to say what matters. This reminds me of Nur. She too had cancer and was a model of strength a feisty blessing. I remember when she died, I was so sad, yet the light was merciless in its beauty that day, forcing me to begin to heal. It made me realize in those painfully bright hours that no matter how I turn away, the magnificent light follows background to my sadness. It works the other way too. I have known such moments of complete simplicity that all my problems and limitations seemed for the moment to vanish, but they were there growing like mold in the dark. So I learned that no matter how I lift my heart, my shadow creeps in weight behind background to my joy. And when I tried to outrun the fact that I had cancer, it became quite clear that no matter how fast I run, a stillness without thought is where I end. Even when repairing in the quiet of February afternoon, alone, my ribs all taped, I had to accept that no matter how long I sit, there is a river of motion I must rejoin. It seems that the way of our many lives Wherever we are led, the opposite waits. When I am down, you are up. When you are weak, I am strong. How else to explain that when I can't hold my head up, it always falls in the lap of one who has just opened? How else to understand that when I finally free myself of burden, there is always someone's heavy head landing in my arms? It's how we grow and heal again and again by holding and being held. In my own life, I have been held and dropped, have hurt and soothed others, enough to accept at last that the reasons of the heart are leaves in the wind. Stand up tall and everything will nest in you. Yet this is not a complaint. It is, it is as it should be, must be, the way everything natural extends and grows. We all lose and we all gain. Dark crowds the light, not light fills the pain. Living is a conversation with no end, a dance with no steps, a song with no words, a reason too big for any mind. No matter how we turn or are turned, the magnificent follows. Wow. Um, very good, very nice. Uh, the next reader is Cindy from the same group. 
Um, well, I, I want you to picture Anne for a moment. Uh, someone already said something about the white linen blouse, and uh, and that's really funny because I was going to talk about that in my introduction. Um, so uh, I just I I met Anne 32 years ago um, at the Oregon Council of Teachers of English Law Conference, and uh, I was there to read an essay. Um, and so here's what happened. This isn't a poem. This is just a little introduction. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. So uh, I met Anne in October of 1990 at the Oregon Council of Teachers of English Conference. Uh, I had, it was eight, I was eight and a half months pregnant at the time. My son would be born on November 3rd, just a few weeks later. And I was wearing the only thing that still fit, which was a royal blue broadcloth maternity one piece jumpsuit. Right now, Juxtapose the picture of Anne standing next to this person. Okay, uh, I must have looked like Violet Beauregard in Willy Wonka when just before she turns into the blueberry, you know, this big blue round thing. And after I read, uh, I was approached by this very elegantly dressed woman with lovely silver hair and lively eyes who told me how much she had enjoyed the reading. She was striking, she was tall and statuesque and beautiful. And she had on a lovely white linen blouse, uh, a black skirt, black flats, and several pieces of beautiful silver jewelry. She took my breath away, but of course being eight and a half months pregnant, it, it wasn't hard to do. I couldn't breathe anyway, but uh, still. Almost exactly a year later, I found that she was coming to be an English teacher at the high school where I taught. Uh, and in fact, her classroom was adjacent to my classroom. And it was then that we started this 32 year friendship, which was more like a sisterhood. And I was in, uh, Jim was talking about how he always felt that she was an older sister. So, um, uh, and I miss her greatly. I, I wanted to start reading with uh, a piece from Afternoon Sky, Harney Desert, which is the book Marilyn had mentioned. Uh, and it's about, um, it's called Life Studies. So here's Anne's poem. No one told us we had to study our lives. Many people do not and are astonished to discover that others of us do. It is a different kind of intelligence to look from above or from afterward and then wonder what really happened that summer afternoon in 1953? Did I really say that to my father? Is this the love I prayed for and then received? I am relieved that I don't have children because these kinds of questions would have to be engaged again and again and again. I like studying my own life, answering the questions in poems, but I also learn by studying others' lives, Virginia Woolf's or Emily's or Billy Collins, their words revealing and instructive. Today I wrote a list poem, names of poems I did not write, but each title gave away one line versions of those poems. Writing about not writing them was writing them after all. Here is a story about yesterday. I talked on the phone with someone I love. The conversation saddened me. Once again, I wrote a poem about the experience and today it is raining. So the poem that I wrote, that that poem triggered, uh, what is called No One Told Us. It's from the first line of Anne's poem. I wonder if other people study their lives the way that writers do, examining the details in search of enlightenment, joy, or regret. Many I know just do not seem that curious. They act and move on, never taking stock of motive, impulse, will, inclination. After all, what's done is done, and there's no sense in belaboring the point. Is there? The past is past, unless or until it isn't. Why should life be a constant inner dialogue 
a series of questions, some with answers not worth the energy or the pain it took to ask. Where is the value in second guessing how we reacted, what we said to whom, the colors we chose? How does it help to think about thinking, to retrace the way we arrived at that place, made that decision, came to that conclusion? We who write, observe, note, pay attention, ask, what did I learn from living that experience, reading that book, talking to that person? What others view as vocation, writers call instinct. No one told us we had to study our lives. We just know. Um, then I have, I have two poems. Um, short ones based on um, interactions with Anne. Uh, and the first one um, I wrote back in September. Um, my son got married the last weekend of September and Anne was at the point in her illness that it was really hard for her to travel. So she was unable to attend the wedding. Um, but I just, uh, I, I visited her and this poem came from it and it's called Passing. I turn up the front walkway of my dear friend's house between the two tall rows of blueberry bushes, cheerful card and loaf of fresh bakery bread in hand. Sunlight warms my back as I stand at the door and ring the bell. We greet each other with smiles and an embrace as we have done for more than 30 years. Between us, there is ease as always. Conversation and laughter flow like healing water, like fine wine. The cat purrs, the tea gives off its fragrant steam. Yet this time, I sense the presence of an undercurrent. I recognize this as fear. Her weakness, difficult speech, all remind me of the way my mother was just before she entered the hospital for the last time, when the doctors told us there was nothing more they could do. But we know ourselves and understand each other. We will enjoy this present time as long as we still have it. Laugh with shining eyes and draw strength from one another as we exchange the gifts of memory. When the hour is gone and she begins to tire, I take my leave with a kiss, open the front door to radiant sunshine, the neighbor's sunflowers, and the bright blue wing of a jay passing. Um, this, this next one is, um, Anne had said, grief is just one more version of love. And I think that's a quote from one of her poems as well. So this is a poem I wrote in response to that poem. There's a lot to be said for grief, for the kind of sorrow that comes in waves and makes it hard to breathe. And for the dull ache, which gives us time to become so used to it that we don't notice it so much anymore. Loss makes of us one family. Some wail and keen, some act out in anger, raging against death or change. Others sit silent, listening for the lessons that will come. Eventually, we all rise, resume the journey, limping down the crooked path toward revelation, refined by what grief has taught us about love. Great, thank you. Okay, um, next on the menu is a, a, a couple of people, Liz Schillinger, and, Liz Schillinger and Jessica Mackey from another one of Anne's groups. And uh, you guys can decide who's first and or if you're together and go for it. <laughs> you off? got this. Okay. You were you're off mute. Okay. Hi everybody. Uh, glad to be here and uh, uh, glad to have a chance of um, sharing some of Anne's poetry. 
I've been, um, gosh, for almost a year reading, reading, reading all these books. And, uh, but here's one of my favorites from her second collection, Instructions for the Wishing Light. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Rhymes with damn it. What the river says, this is what I say, William Stafford. The Willamette dares the stranger to say her name. One needs the dictionary syllables, will am it, but even they are confusing. The river says, I have a direction. And although I am racing now after a January deluge, I might meander in late August. I have streamside beds and the riverbed of the hundred year flood, a heron's nest at the bridge, the inevitable otters. You are welcome here with your little dramas and sorrows. You may sit and dream or speak to someone in the Eastern time zone, watch the walkers, the dogs on leashes, the careening rebel skateboarders. There is life here, an eternal flow, one way toward the infinite. Oh, it's such a good one. Such a good choice. Uh, let's see. Oh, that's the last one. Okay, um, this from uh, uh, Small Beauties. Awakening on the spring equinox. The flowers are present, bright yellow daffodils in hardy groups, purple crocus in the front yard. Around the corner, cherry trees bloom at the art center. I'm still catching up pen in hand, while Alex works on the south side garden beds, digging, disposing in sunlight. Lucy's having some breakfast, then we'll return to sleep on the back room bed. Courtney is out for his daily walk, three miles with three friends. It's almost 11 a.m. And I am still awakening. Just so. Fantastic. So fantastic. Okay, Jess is <laughs> going to help me with this next one. <laughs> Fire in the desert. You can do it. I can do it. You can do it. <laughs> you know, reading these books um, several times now over the past year, um, the, port the portraits Anne uh, has written about herself are... Um, just beautiful. She shows us a lot about her childhood and her young um, teen self. And then as a young adult, you know, crossing the country and then going to Brazil. And um, then these very stunning poems uh, in later life. But this one uh, is a different way she's telling us that. And it's called, I have been a tree in a culvert. <laughs> I have been the bee pollinating the rose and a series of cumulus clouds in a blue sky. I have been the sound of rain on a tin roof and the smell of pesto on homemade pasta. Also, the sound of roller skates on cement and ice skates on Swan Lake in Uptown Harrisburg, PA. I have been the sound of a lover's cry and the Pacific waves breaking on the beach, the smell of freshly ground coffee and the hurt of heartbroken sadness. I have been my mother's voice, my father's patient silence, my older brother's joyful laughter, the knowledge of my younger brother's regrets. You read the last one. I have been the colors of a sunset and the warmth of a fire, the sadness facing death. I have been all of these things because I am alive. I am alive. Is that you? 
Thanks. <clears throat> and then. Sorry about that. That's great. <laughs> hey, it just interrupted our, our own, you know? That's the, the most polite it could be. <laughs> um, so I tried to choose one of Anne's and there's just so many good ones as you guys all know. Um, but I thought my best tribute to Anne would be through the poems I actually wrote for her um, since I've known her. And I'm also, as Barr said, a newer friend. Um, the first time I saw Ann Staley at the Ike box on Cottage Street, I thought, now there is a woman who knows her worth. Dress smart. This was no amateur hour. She was seated next to me. I tried not to stare. She was on the list after me. And after she read, I forgot what I had done completely. The breadth and width of her written word stopped, stunned. This was a poet. I was thankful I had read first. <laughs> and this one was written somewhere in between the last and the first. I attended my friend's poetry reading. Here, the scholar, teacher, the poet with her hair curled and glasses perfectly positioned on her nose in peak form. I love the Saturday morning version of this woman. <laughs> Bangs slightly askance, robe slipping off a shoulder and tired, vibrant eyes, searching for spectacles. Here too, the poet, a Saturday morning, sleepy, deep sort of introspecting musing, blunt, but kind. She crafts words, chooses them slowly, deliberately, like tasting the first berries of spring. Saturday morning, we are just ourselves, still delightful, still charming, a bit more rumpled and real. And then <clears throat> this last one, um, I wrote uh, the day after I last saw her, which uh, was the day before she passed. Um, but it's actually about just the beautiful camaraderie, sisterhood, friendship, and just love that surrounded Anne at all times. Friendship is a poem. Sitting quietly at your bedside, silent vigil to your rest, reading acknowledgments and accolades you've placed on the shelf, noting you sip only juice now. Anything that matters is here. Just as you will still be here, even after you've gone to explore the rogue rivers of what's next. In our words, our thoughts, <clears throat> our quiet contemplation, there you are, echoing and eternal, as are we all. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Mark, I could do one myself, or we can switch it over to uh, open mic, whatever you think. Go, Jim. Okay, good. Um, so this is a this is a two page full two page poem, and it's got these statements of her belief that I totally agree with. Um, and we used to have so much fun talking. Uh, sometimes after writing together with gin and tonics, <laughs> but I think I met her at a conference where. Um, she and, and Steve Jones and I, and maybe another had to do a presentation. And it's so funny because she had to make up a bio for me because I wasn't there when that was needed. And she made up a bio that wasn't correct, but it was probably the true, the wannabe me. She said I was a surfer raised in Southern California and I've never been on a surfboard but I probably projected this image that um, she picked up on and I'm really proud of it. Anyway, here's the poem, it's called Once, with thanks to Wendell Berry. Facts don't interest me as much as character or heart. It's the look in your eyes or your laughter, your voice that are my keys to you. 
still I can do a onceness list to rival any poet. And now this is this, sorry to interrupt. This is a really great narrative of experiences. I once constructed a small dam collecting field stones in order to show a creek, the, uh, to, to slow a creek, thus creating a swimming hole at my Girl Scout camp. We were supposed to be napping or writing letters home, but the sound of moving water called to me. I once hitchhiked from Oregon to San Francisco. The first driver who stopped had the AC on, quote, extremely cold in the van. As we talked, I realized it was a hearse delivering a body to a morgue in Sacramento. <laughs> um, on the same journey, a tractor trailer picked me up at the rest stop and we raced toward the Y junction trying to find the hearse I left my purse on the passenger side floor. It held the remaining money, $500, from my 10,000 mile cross country trip. I lived in a teepee once. My mother-in-law hasn't spoken to me for 30 years since our first meeting. Some might consider this silence a stroke of luck. Last week, she told her son, tell the wife hello. My younger brother died on the streets of Baltimore, homeless, a John Doe. I picked up his ashes at the PO and walked him home. Once I cheated on an algebra test, I wasn't ejected from the honor society, but I should have been. The teacher caught my eye and didn't say a word. He didn't have to. I still carry that shame, the disappointment in his eyes recently on a Recently on a road trip, I was called a princess. I put my thumb out on Interstate 80, attempting to hitch to Rock Springs, Wyoming. No one picked me up. An elder carrying a black leather handbag. The billboard said, trust in Jesus, and if you die today, where will you go? No one, no, not one driver was a good Samaritan. I used to be so mesmerized by process that I couldn't get to the content. In life, I read recently, it's not so important what you know, but the ways in which you put it all together. And that's got to be one of my favorite things we shared was that she was so, not so interested in facts, but more interested in the truth or the essence of things. That's what we share together was we seem to match up really well that on that score. Thank you, people. Thank you, readers. That's the main, that's the first part. <laughs> thank you, Jim. Yeah. And thank you, readers, um, everybody who shared. Um, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna transition over to an open mic. And so the way we've been doing it is you go to the, reaction button and you hit the raise hand button, your hand goes up and you pop to the top of the screen. Uh, three poems are five minutes. Um, if you want to say, so, if you had some kind of a Ann Staley story or, or comment or whatever, please feel free to share. Um, and um, that's the way we're going to go. Okay. Uh, so um, I'm going to go from the top of the people who have, who have their hands raised on my screen, our screens are probably a little bit different. So, um, but Ann Stinson is the first person up. Um, so take it away, Ann. All right. So I met Ann Staley in 2014 at Manuka, which is um, a place where the Portland Creative Arts Community holds their um, summer uh, workshops. And my mom always went to do clay and I'm not a visual artist. So I went with my mom and I took her class. And uh, the first year that I went, my brother had just been diagnosed with, uh, with cancer. And over the three years that I took Anne's class, uh, he, he passed away. Um, but um, I see Judy Tufel is on uh, this call, on this conference. Um, 
she ended up being my roommate the first year, um, which was an amazing thing uh, for me. And um, I did my first writing in 30 years in that class. And um, I was able to publish a book just this last fall based on some of the writing um, that I started there. Um, OSU Press published it in November. And I'd like to read something that first was created under the benevolent eyes of Anne. Simple berry buckle, butter, eggs, sugar, lemon, flour, and berries. Picking the berries is the best part. It brings Steve, my brother, to me. He died with blackberry scratches on his hands. And the vines still grow, trailing blackberries low to the ground. New vines stretch along the edge of a clear cut, now filling with four-year-old pine, fir, and cedar, along with foxglove, mullein, and daisies. It was Steve's favorite spot, and it is still full of fruit. Next year, the shade from the growing trees might not let in enough sunlight. My favorite trove this summer is a broken down cedar log, decaying for 50 to 60 years, its red flesh webbed with vines, each bearing five or six plump berries. A pileated woodpecker drums nearby, a hummingbird whirs in the fireweed. I'm so determined to pick a berry hiding under a salal leaf, I get nettles on my chin. Steve feels near and I can almost hear him chuckling. An hour of picking and my container is full. I walk home in my hickory shirt and Carhartts, my arms and legs unpierced by the thorns. The berry juices paint the batter red. The oven that baked Steve's last pie plumps and goldens the cake. Our fractured but mending family digs through cream to the warm buckle and finds Steve's berries from the young forest. And I sent this book to Anne in November and she sent me a sweet note back and the newest uh, chat book of hers and telling me that she was struggling with her own battle with cancer. And I'm so sorry that it went so fast. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, next is Richard. Hello. Um, I wished I would have known Anne. She sounds like a truly wonderful person and I, um, Thank you for all the poetry that you've read this evening. Um, I've got two poems I wrote this week I'd like to read. This first one is called With No Address. I throw stones at the moon on the golden bridge to a gateway road on the boundary of Godland for one hour, one minute, one second. With no address that echoes from the tumult of a choir weeping clamor, singing everything they can in abstract wonder, breathing in rain and thunder. The heat of my heart warms it for missions of tributes on the corner, waiting for the last bus to arrive just in time to leave this city. I am no immigrant, but a traveling salesman who sells nothing to no one because no one is home anymore. Everyone is gone in a junk heap of time and I have to go home and grow tomatoes for my tomorrows. Uh, this next one is called, I Am Not Alone. Gone are the riders on tracks of moonbeams where grizzled wormwood scrub is ashen early. Uh, let me start that again. Gone are the riders on tracks of moonbeams where grizzled wormwood scrub is in ashen early sky morning, cold flamed in this static dawn. Town cocks are crowing in front gardens among dead pink petals of cherry tree blossoms behind willow wattle fences. Croaking ravens in cold breath meadows of heaven, seeds of rain rattle a shutters pillars of dust, heat burdened earth, frightened with terrible eyes. The moon broke through, cracked 
shell of a cloud with mutter of murderous thunder beyond the meadows. I am old. The winds of below my cheeks. In my hat I hold the guff, the birdhouse, treasury of souls. Sparrows know who I am. I quiver with the cosmos of dawn. And Laelia, the angel, watches over me as the first sparrow that I release from my hands flies off to the promised land, to the tree of souls to nest. Blue pool moon water is deep to fulfill its basin, it is where I keep all reasons for everything and everyone. For the fulfillment of the creation I have begun, I once was alone, but now I am not. And I kind of mungled the reading of that, so I'm sorry, but thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, Sue is next. Hi. <clears throat> I only met Anne on Zoom and I was so impressed. I wish I'd had a chance to, to really get to know her. Um, I have a couple of poems I want to share tonight. It's sort of similar in tone, but we'll see. It's just how it's coming out. Um, this one is called Green Tea. Across the street on the trunk of the purple Chevy that hasn't run in so long, weeds are growing up through the floorboards. It's just a green and yellow plastic package, a six pack of sweet green tea the 80 year old neighbor forgot, hurrying to get his wife, calling to, for him from her wheelchair. That she's home again is a miracle, but only her voice is the same. Who is this bony gray haired ghost? Where's the sass that made him laugh? He walks bent these days, lets the mail get wet in the box. The door is rusted off. It's only bills he'll never pay. He spent his life laying bricks that tore up his meaty hands, but now the walls are crumbling. The mortar has dried, not holding on. For a week, the tea has sat in sun, wind, and rain that drips past the bright Lipton label over the trunk and to the ground. I hesitate to intervene to remind him of my widowhood. The car's not going anywhere. He'll get thirsty soon enough. And this one is a true story from last weekend. Thank you. In God's house. Oh, I have an epigraph from Matthew from the Bible. For I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. In God's house. He stacks everything he owns under an orange tarp against the wall in the church hall where the old lady singers warble, practicing for Saturday mass. A while back, he asked to sing when he could come around. All puffed up with Christianity, they welcomed him in. Come on in, but now they look away. Slouching in a metal folding chair, wearing so many layers he has no bones, he mutters about hypothermia about how he's likely to die tonight in this fucking rain and wind. They sing of God, of love, of peace. He stares at the wall, says fucking A. Old Broad to his wife gets up, carries her purse to the loo. Glances pass over his head. He follows them into the church, accepts a chair and a book, stares at the newly vacuumed rug, red like his cheeks and his eyes aflame in the paschal candlelight. A ponytailed old man bustles over, wearing an Alban cassock. Take off your hat, son. Show respect. Fucking A, he snaps. I will not. He jumps up, ready to strike. All of this caught in the microphones. Hand on his shoulder, an old singer says, calm down. We're in God's house. You have three choices. Listen, pray, or sing. I guess I'll sing, he mutters, backing down. And the woman prays, a little afraid. He's inches away, reeking of sweat. She's caught between charity and shame. In God alone my hope, they sing, her cracked high voice, his lower one. After mass, a man comes up, offers him a $10 bill. Get yourself something to eat before you catch the bus. He nods and walks into the rain. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Um, Annis is next. 
Thank you, Mark. I didn't know Anne, but I feel like I kind of know her since listening to all the poems and the tributes from everyone. And um, it really has motivated me to look her up and see what I can find out more about her. Thank you for everyone for that. Um, last summer I took a sonnets class. So this is one of my early attempts at sonnets. It's called morning meditation. My mind and body know the drill. Make a nest, get comfy, become still enough to notice every noise inside and out, observe the smallest sounds. Without a doubt, south flying geese overhead, their shrill honks blend with traffic and a mower's hum as I transcend into calm, a solitude to refill the reservoir of one depleted daily by demands of family and just living life a nurturer whose natural disposition tilts toward giving. In other words, woman, mother, teacher, friend, and wife. Thoughts still come and go, spill into mind's precious silence where I will invoke the divine in me and wait for guidance. We are still, but always in motion. Heartbeats belie the motionless. Thank you. And the second one is one I wrote this week um, called 1952. It's summer and the three of us lying nine-year-olds are pleading for a dime for ice cream, but plotting and scheming to buy cigarettes and a package of Sin Sins, imagining ourselves cool and hip like our parents. Instead, puffing and coughing, hiding our stash, believing we can fool our mothers, then discovering we are dead wrong. And me, languishing, waiting for the lecture that never comes. My mother, wearing a tiny smile, silently tilting back and forth in the wicker rocking chair on our red floored porch. Thanks. Thank you, Annis. Uh, Billy is next. Thank you, Sin Sins. I had forgotten about those. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> uh, okay, these are just a couple of recent ones. Um, I guess that's all I'll say about it. Hot chocolate. Hot chocolate. My Give me a packet of hot chocolate. Almost a month ago, or a year ago, or a long time ago. I made hot chocolate today. I put my milk in a pretty cup. I warmed it in the microwave for one minute. Added the chocolate, stirred, and returned it to the microwave for another I opened the microwave to a brown watery mess with dark blobs of chocolate swimming and sticking to the side of the pretty cup. The dark blobs tasted delicious as I licked them off my finger. Never mind, it was easy to clean up as I had cleaned the microwave plate just two days ago. Yay! I did not let the mess take away from the pleasure yet to be. Hot chocolate, sweet treat for the senses. I remember the delight. So glad I didn't wait to partake in this moment of now. That was sometimes I save things for later and i did not save that job it was great um and this was uh just a prompt off of something else i was doing so i called it the beach the beach no wait the ocean the beach is a beautiful place to play to get lost in the rocks and shells and sand and sounds 
the beach. She calls me to notice and become part of the greater one, the ocean. The ocean draws me in, putting me in my place. I hear her roar. I feel the waves soar. I am mesmerized by what I adore. Watching the vastness of the ocean, I know and become the speck of sand that I am. I am one speck of this great universe. So are you and you. The world would not be what it is today without you and me. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Billy. Uh, Emily is next. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for reading. And like others have said, I feel like I know Anne a little better. Um, I did find a poem of hers that I'm going to share. It's real short. It's called Stray Paragraphs in April, Year of the Red Monday, with thanks to Charles Wright. Only those who are living are able to die. The others are, are already in the great beyond. Voiceless without a word to say, death with the sound of Bach. Desire in its highest form, the cats sleeping entwined in the back bedroom. Two flowering azaleas, steady heartbeat after a decade, the cold of midwinter. Make of yourself a light, the Buddha said. But what kind of light? A house light, a candle, a porch light? April is the cruelest month, said T.S. Eliot. The damp becomes emerald green. My soul is on fire. I love that. Okay, so um, a lot of you don't know this, but a couple of weeks ago, I read a poem by Pablo Neruda. And I have this great big collection of his poetry. I found him only in the last few months. So um, <laughs> I have read some poems and it surprised me. So this is called Before Neruda. Before I even heard of you, Neruda, I must have known you because your heart is known to mine. I know that now because I found your phrases in my own poems before I ever knew you existed. How odd it is to read someone else's words conspiring to appear on my page or from my mouth, as my sister's voice never fails to do after a visit, after being separated for years. And there it is, her voice emanating out of my mouth as your words, Neruda, emerge out of my mind, then translated into a poem I wrote before I ever heard of you or knew that you were a poet. Somehow we are connected heart to heart over time and distance, past death, so par far apart. And yet we are both poets with our own eyes and voices, seeing the world from different places in different times, always escaping into the mutable atmosphere of life and gender, of location and the words of different languages. However, we were brought together. However, inspiration can cross over from beyond. You are my muse, Pablo. May I call you that? May I be familiar without seeming to flirt? There it is, Pablo, my honest confession, sincerely given with modesty for all to see about our bond before I ever knew you existed. And then I have one more, <laughs> the cat's helping me. <laughs> this one's called Ode to Attenuation. I'm just a hack, tinkerer of overused words, of stale phrases and moldy metaphors. But if I know this, does that mean I can change? Can I improve? 
At this late date, it's not likely. I have little time to make mine a life of golden promise, a precursor to renown. In these days, there is more to be had by writing laments, not praise, elegies instead of love poems, requiems and threnodies instead of groveling laudatory odes. But what about tomorrow? Will there be time to pay tribute to blue skies, open seas of pristine water, of beaches empty for turtles to bury eggs, or old stones to exude gems and brilliance into the atmosphere? Try as I might, I find no tomorrow, none that I will see, just sad remains of now, the time of regret and fallow dreams, of drear and dying children, of old men drear drooling in churches without beds, of lying arrogant men and women bleeding in back alleys. I see with blind eyes and hear silence with deaf ears. The rich will live merely days longer than I, wealthy people with stolen water. But the words, where are the words to touch and cleanse, to uplift and evolve like dried rose petals come back to life renewing vows of fragrance and rosiness to become full and vivid, giving grace, needing but a small measure of sunshine. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, Courtney is next. I'm going to read one from Anne's uh, first, well, let's see, I guess you can't, can't get that to focus. Anyway, uh, this is from Anne's uh, first collection, published collection, Primary Sources, uh, published in 2011. It's called November Gosel. Gosel was one of Anne's uh, favorite forms of poetry. November Gosel. The only thing I know is the insensible light, of the incent, sorry, let me start over. The only thing I know is the insensible light disappearing at dusk. Somehow in the blaze of the fire's flame, I remember my father's hands. Tell me why a stranger's face on the street holds my attention, makes me wonder. Have we all agreed about falling snow? This white sky dropping is peace on earth? No one alive now remembers my arrival, daughter born with eyes open to summer. It's all right if the melancholy oboe sings all night. It's all right if geese rest in the gray rows of field stubble. <clears throat> Some masters say we are all wounded here and your wounds are messages from paradise. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, Sydney is next. Well, I don't really have a poem to share. I just, um, so I teach, um, I'm an English professor at Tillamook Bay Community College and I'm teaching introduction to poetry this term. And, you know, it's usually to students that um, have little to no experience with poetry. And we were talking about Emily Dickinson this last week and of course, Walt. And um, we, um, one of my favorite books is this lovely coffee table book called The Gorgeous Nothings. And if you haven't heard of it, it is um, fragments of El Emily Dickinson's poetry that she wrote on the back of envelopes, little scraps of paper. Um, oh, it's, it's, it's a beautiful book. And I brought it into class and we all looked at it, um, not to freak anybody out, but I actually have a tattoo of one of the poems on my arm um, that was written on the back of an envelope flap. Um, but anyway, that aside, beside my nerd, uh, tattoos, um, uh, we were like, I was thinking about that as we were all reading and talking about Anne. And, um, when I told Anne, I was going to revive fireweed, I started getting these gorgeous nothings in the mail. And I, if you haven't seen Anne's handwriting, it's 
it's very petite. It's very, um, you know, and I'd get this like, there she is right there. Um, I would get these little things in the mail and it was just, I don't know how to describe it, but it was like these little artifacts of her life. And as I was trying to put the nonprofit um, together, they kind of just kept me going. And um, like this little envelope, which is like, she has open with love on the front and the back. Um, and I just feel like that is who she is. And, um, you know, just these lovely notes of, and I love how small and petite her handwriting was. It was so tight and so precise. And it reminded me so much of that. And so I feel like I have this collection of gorgeous nothings from her that I will treasure forever. Um, and I was actually thinking about our next issue dedicated to her. And I was, you know, the last email I got from her was that she had fallen. And I don't, no, I mean, it was just one of those emails where you think that's, that might be it. And I emailed her a couple of times after that and got no response. And, and, and so that was, you know, I don't know, it, she, I, I can't describe how important she was to me. I've known her for 30 plus years. Um, but those little notes and these little artifacts have really fueled her. And I really hope that I can honor her legacy, Eric's and David's as well, um, keeping Fire Week going and, um, and really capturing the voices of Oregon poetry. But I will, like, I'm a collector anyway, I will never let these go. I feel like they've made a fireweed and they kept me going because if you've ever started a nonprofit, let me tell you, it's not fun. Um, and, but I, every once in a while I'd get these random, you know, random things in the mail. And as soon as I saw it was her handwriting, I knew it was going to be okay. And I, um, Garrett is here. He's our web designer and has been part of making it look beautiful. Um, and I know that he feels the same way. So I just want to kind of share that, that, you know, um, you know, she, she's just a force of Oregon poetry and she will be sorely missed. And I hope to keep honoring her legacy. Thank you. Thank you, Sydney. Uh, Shirley is next. Okay. Um, I'd like to read a poem by Stephen Keating that he wrote in 2016. And it's an interesting poem. It has to do with life and it also has to do with dying. <clears throat> And I just thought it was a beautiful poem to share. I have come to these fields early, too early perhaps, when the air is still and heavy and droplets of water gleam in the slanting light. There is no one here, only my little plane that rests in the silence. I check the oil and fuel and filters and follow, ever follow, the purest discipline of my pre-flight check. And then finally, with everything now remembered, I bend to loose my tie downs that I may be transformed. I feel the small vibrations as the wind begins to flow across my wings. My quiet little engine has begun to raise its voice. The propeller is chewing up the center line stripes on the runway and the tail is rising. And all together we race across what is left of this little earth. It gets lighter and lighter and louder and louder. And with one last jump, we are free. We know the physics of flight, but it is always a wonder. The air must flow faster in some places than in others. Everything must be balanced. You must have a sense of direction and good planning. Every component must be strong. Things cannot get too old. 
We are lifted up on wings of cloth and wood and allies so light, they weigh almost nothing. They are risen into clouds and with the tips of wings. I have tried to carve my name into every single one. We climb until we can go no higher and falling over backwards, we spin down, pressed against the harness, watching as the earth whirls around us. We turn into our spin and aim for the ground and pull up at the treetops. And with all the speed we have left, we fly low and level and fast. So fast there are chickens in this country that will never lay another egg. We have this machine and I set off across great distances with no more than a compass and a roadmap and the ready assurance that we can land almost anywhere if we have to. But on this day, our compass only spins on the panel. There is no map for where we are going. We may not have enough fuel. There may yet be one more off field landing to do. Maybe a long gliding, drifting down when all the fuel is gone. I will feather off the swirling propeller and level my wings and set myself into whatever earth I find in one final amazing untidy landing, plowing up some Elysian fields and maybe leaving a long deep furrow right up to the feet of those whom I have loved and who have loved and still love me. It is always a wonder. Thank you. I just thought it was Stephen wrote his most wonderful poem and I wanted to share it. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you. Um, anybody else want to read something before I before I move on? Yeah, okay, Norma. <laughs> I would like to have one of those yellow, little yellow hands. Help me. <laughs> I've been. <clears throat> I, I tripped over myself writing poems in the 80s. And it's so funny because I'll read them and it, I do not recognize myself. It's very strange. <clears throat> but these I recognize, or this one I recognize. <clears throat> For Helen, mother in law, spirit sister, secrets kept in closet corners, precious things put away out of sight, imprisoned by the fear of being lost or being found. Radar eyes, Aquarian genius, selects the exquisite from among the common, finds the gem in the mountain of stones, wants it, takes it, has it. She's gone, secrets freed, Conquests revealed to the next of kin. Loving beauty was her sin. Taking it was her shame. Keeping it was her delusion. Thank you, Norma. Yeah. So, um, I've got three poems here. Um, first, uh, just a short word about Anne and the Salem Poetry Project. Anne um, was our featured reader, our third featured reader after we moved out of Frozen Nation and into the Ike Box in uh, July 7th of 2017, sorry, 2016, in our first year. And then she came back and was a featured reader for us again on September 7th, 2017, and then again on December 6th, 2018, and then again on February 7th, 2019, and then again on April 4th, 2021. Um, and like Sydney, I would occasionally get little notes from, from Anne, and I was always appreciative with that excellent handwriting. <laughs> that I can't, that is completely escapes me. And, a, and an occasional broadside, which was very nice um, because we would find each other at events. Yeah, like, like Cindy showing uh, a wonderfully composed broadside printed on nice paper. And I would think to myself, I should do that. And then I never do it. 
So, um, but a very generous and warm spirit and somebody that I'm going to miss having as a featured reader every year. <laughs> so, um, and she was a terrific poet, a terrific reader, and and just loved to have her just to kind of be around. We uh, met up at different events all the time, just like Marilyn and a whole bunch of other people, Jim. Sword and Poetry Festival, uh, the Mid Valley Festival that happened at the library and all kinds of other events that happened around. It was just wonderful to see every time that she was there. Uh, so here's one of her poems uh, that I found, uh, which I really enjoy, called Looking Up River, August. There's a dove somewhere cooing, a flag at half-mast. A young man tends a burned pile, leaves from last night's once in 21 years storm, lightning, hail too, says Ray, the neighbor with three earrings. Last night too, in utter darkness, a raccoon tussled with a river otter who slipped away downstream just as three more coons appeared and swam in front of the deck. A territorial issue, a smallish war, but that was last night. This evening, sun setting out beyond the sisters, those girls still holding snow patches on their northern flanks with candlelight, wine, blankets. We watch the day blind stars come on. The Dipper, North Star, a bright invisible planet near this moving water. I am an innocent. So that's a poem by Anne, lovely. Um, here's an old one for me. It's called, uh, I've just taken a look at it earlier on. It's called Expressions of Boris Karloff. And this starts with a little snippet of dialogue from Bride of Frankenstein. And it's the monster speaks and he says, yes, go, you live, go. You stay, we belong dead. Unaccepted untouched, unattractive, uncared for. Trapped in an animated course, he reaches for friends. He wants love, basically a child. And when that fails, spectacularly fails, hatefully, completely fails, Rage, broken bodies, limbs ripped off, death, terror. This ongoing torture, it makes you wonder which is worse, the horror of undying or the hell of living on. So <laughs> that's Boris Karloff. <laughs> and this is a poem I've been working on this week. Uh, it's called The Motion of Stars, and it's after Vangelis. And it, here's the poem. Polaris is the axis, Stella Polaris, that sure and steady fixture in the darkness. Ptolemy, Pythias, Amasalia, Christopher Columbus, Julius Caesar. Look to that strong and constant northern star, rely on it. Lost and found through it, the center of the whirling wheel wending steadily east to west from night to day. Or was that us, tilting on a pole's pivot point, wiggling 
back and forth so gently, so violently. Congruent Polaris, the triplet star viewed from 433 light years away, one giant, two more, a little smaller than the sun, waltzing each other in their own wild wheeled and spinning across the sky, across the cosmos, like we are. Around this unregarded cousin, a fleck on the muscular arm of the Milky Way. It's only a matter of time, you know. A few thousand years, a blink, and the North Star wanders off, falls from the north like the red-cheeked woman, swirls away, and Daneb takes its place. The North Star will always be north, as north as it, as it needs to be, sprinting, spinning, set in place, steady, by chance. As we turn, orbit, and travel in at least three dimensions at once, concerned with our own pathways, our own starways. So do you. Okay, so thank you all very much. Thank you to all the readers. Thank you to everyone who participated in the open mic. <laughs> And, and the two reading groups and Jim for kind of collecting everybody there. And also thank you very much to Anne that we were able to honor you tonight. Um, next week, we have Lorna Rose. So we'll see you all next week. Um, have a good evening, everybody. And a great evening. Thank you, thank you. This was really lovely. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. you. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Great Mark. seeing you all. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Courtney.